Amina? Yes, uh, so I've muted everyone. Claire, could you please unmute yourself? Uh, uh, we, we start the recording. Yes, I've, I've started it. On, on Facebook as well? Okay, um, give me one minute for that. Okay, sure, 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 of course. Okay, should I start? No, no, just just a second. I, I'll introduce you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and no, no, we 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 are just trying to uh, to to get the um, the live the live stream um, on on Facebook started. So that's what right, right. I are, are waiting for. There's a few couple of minutes. Sure. Okay, I mean, now I heard. Okay, I, I think we are going to, um, uh, to start the to start. Uh, the streaming is not working at the moment, but um, we'll we'll find a way. <laughs> so, hello everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the fourth session of the doctoral seminar series. To the fourth, sorry, like six session. We had we had a few more. Um, my name is Dominique Samba. I'm a researcher at Huma and I'm, I, I'm hosting this seminar. So um, the recording will be available maybe on Facebook, but at least on the Huma YouTube channel. Um, you'll find the program for the, next, um, for the next sessions on the Huma website and on our social media. Uh, for, for the last two quarters, we have invited speakers to reflect on the challenges and strategies of doctoral work with a particular focus on the turning points and critical experiences that shaped their research journey. Uh, Claire and Lester, uh, our uh, guest today, was a PhD in sociology from Stellenbosch University and a MacPhil in justice and transformation from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Her research interests include transitional and so socioeconomic justice. She's a Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow and a social science a research Council, Next Generation Social Sciences in Africa Fellow. Her MacPhil and doctoral research uh, anal analyzed the function of official discourse of Commission of Inquiry investigating state violence uh, in the South African mining sector in particular. Claire Anne's research as, at Huma, where she's a fellow, uh, a postdoctoral fellow, traces ethical and social issues surrounding AI and prenatal diagnostic testing in South Africa and Ghana in the context of the so-called uh, fourth industrial capitalist revolution. So uh, Claire is going to speak for about uh, 15, 20 minutes. 
and uh, then we'll have uh, time for uh, a conversation together. Um, so, uh, Dr. Lester, uh, the floor is yours. Um, welcome to the doctoral seminar. Thank you so much, Dominique, and thanks for everyone for being here to, um, to listen to my presentation. I am going to be sharing my screen so that a oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Maybe someone can allow me to share my screen. Are you able to change that, Dominique? Can you try again, Claire? Okay, there it is. Share. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. Let's go there. Um, sorry, everyone. Uh, I should have pressed play already. Oh, there. Okay. Can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes, we can. Perfect. You can. Okay, you can see my PowerPoint. Okay. So, so yeah, my presentation is on critical discourse analysis. Um, my prompt for this series is topics that can assist doctoral students in their studies. So I decided to share the methodological approach that I used in my own PhD, which I recently submitted. Um, and that approach was a critical discourse combined with ideological analysis. And that I applied to two post-apartheid commissions of inquiry that were investigating mining sector violence. That was the TRC or the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which had a particular, which had a section which looked into institutional hearings on the mining sector, and then the Marikana Commission of Inquiry, which investigated a recent massacre in 2012 on a particular platinum mine. So um, if you want more details on that, like if you're unfamiliar with it, we can just discuss it later, but just to give a bit of context. Um, so any substantial body of research will require you to set out your research methodology. And what is methodology? Well, simply it's setting out the way that you're going to be answering your research questions. So often you'll begin reading your topic, you'll come up with your research question and sub questions. And then you'll think about the most appropriate way to go about answering these questions. So methods are usually associated with disciplines, but when doing interdisciplinary work, which I think some of you are, you can also make use of mixed methods and of course tweak methods uh, to make them appropriate to answer your particular question. It's also true that the particular topic of discourse analysis has been approached from many angles and there isn't really a single way of doing it. Um, of course, some, some ways are better than others or more appropriate for answering particular questions, depending on your discipline. In general, my presentation, let me just move our faces, I'm covering half my page. Okay, so in short, the presentation, um, I'm gonna cover three areas. First is just the developing a method from the research question, which we will do using the, my particular research question. Then I'm going to outline the approach to discourse analysis that I used. And then we're gonna go into some general questions surrounding what is ideology, where I'll propose a critical approach to ideological discourse analysis. So my, like I said, my PhD research was analysis of two post-apartheid uh, commissions of inquiry investigating violence in the mining sector. And my question had two components to it, which I've listed below. The first is how was violence conceptualized in these two post-apartheid commissions of inquiry, um, which included the TRC and the Marikana Commission of Inquiry. So if we look at this question, you can see that this is more the descriptive part of the thesis, right? So if you look at that, it would involve some kind of 
description of the way that violence is conceptualized or understood or represented in the, um, in the text of the commission reports. Um, so already it's clear from this question that part of my methodology will involve engaging with the text itself. So with the language, with the written representation or interpretation of this um, event and its key actors. And for just to make things simple, I'll be focusing more on the Marikana Commission of Inquiry when I use um, for this presentation. So this obviously prompts some kind of discursive analysis. So as I started doing this, analyzing the commission reports and so forth, and the transcriptions of the hearings, um, how the judge spoke to people giving um, testimony and so forth, I started to reveal some contradictions in how these endeavors of official truth seeking, which is what the commissions are, um, just it, it exposed some contradictions. And so I developed this second research question, which was why do the TRC and Marikana commissions frame violence in the way they do? And what are the implications of this framing for truth and justice? Also, these two commissions were chosen because of their purported aims to achieve truth and justice, like the TRC, of course, in its name, but also the Marikana Commission of Inquiry's official motto was truth, restoration, and justice. So I was interested in how these commissions were speaking to one another, one as one that was set up just at the transition to democracy and another about 20 years into democracy. So as you can see from the second question, it's a far more analytical question, right? Um, analytical questions tend to include the words like why. So this would be the more the type of question you'd probably need to ask in your PhD research, moving away from merely description of what's happening to more like why or how are these things happening. Literature I then consulted on commissions of inquiry had many views of the various functions of these official commissions, which range from fact finding, truth seeking, their educational role, accountability, and their archival roles. But for me, the most convincing studies that I found explain their use as fashioning some kind of official discourse on a particular problem of governance um, and to legitimate the truth of the state. So that was from a particular theorist called Adam Ashworth. If you're doing any kind of work on commissions of inquiry or discourse, I'd recommend this book, The Politics of Official Discourse. So really I wanted to know what was the official discourse on violence from the perspective of the TRC and the Marikana commissions, both as post-apartheid commissions of inquiry. As my work also studied commissions of inquiry that were particularly investigating state violence. Of course, there are many kinds of commissions of inquiry. Um, it became clear to me that my work also needed to engage with some kind of understanding of ideology. The topic of violence, especially in relation to the state, inevitably raises questions concerning justification and legitimacy. If you think about Weber and his understanding of the state is wielding legitimate violence. So there's something about the state violence and legitimacy that I was trying to work out. So it includes that, but as well as the, when dealing with the fact that there have been deaths um, or killing as in, in, as in these cases, it also involved looking at the schematics employed through law discourse and ideology and custom to legitimate or make acceptable some forms of violence like the police violence over others, i.e. the violence um, used in the protests by the mine workers. <clears throat> so let's start at this course. Traditionally, the study of discourse is the study of language use, the communication of beliefs, and ideas and the way a way of interacting in certain social institutions. Discourse study is also an approach that can be used in many disciplines within the social sciences. So if you're studying literature, history, sociology, political studies, or obviously doing interdisciplinary work. So for example, one could ask how certain racial identities or subjects become constructed through language or through discourse. 
how they're in, constructed as inferior through process of colonization to exploit the natural resources in a country, in a particular country, right? So this would be interdisciplinary because we are combining discursive work, which might be associated more with literary analysis or linguistics with a historical analysis and an analysis of political economy. So you're seeing how you're sort of combining um, your disciplines, which is interdisciplinary. But within discourse analysis, you'll also find various approaches um, like textbooks and handbooks on how to do discourse analysis. So when working out which approach you're gonna use, it's really just about reading and finding out which approach you find most appropriate to your research. But I'll, I'll go on to explain the one that I use. So I use discourse more in line with a common usage or how someone might in the street refer to discourse, um, like a medical discourse or a feminist discourse or modernization discourse. So I use this rather than a form of linguistic communication per se, mostly because when I engaged in with like say Foucault's approach to discourse and archeology span of knowledge, it seemed to me a bit um, obscure or too abstract, which is complicated in his use of terms like enunciative modalities and formation of objects and so forth. And I think if I were doing a different type of project, this might be the way to go where one could reasonably construct a an analytical framework from Foucault's concepts, right? And this has certainly been done in the past, but I didn't want to spend too much time on that technical linguistic stuff. I wanted to know more about how general discourses were functioning in these official commissions in a way that really impacted their outcomes in terms of finding justice for victims of state violence. So I used a, a a conception provided by Andre de Toy. He used to teach at UCT in the political studies department. And to use de Toy's formulation, a discourse is a fairly comprehensive and systematically articulated ensemble of specific ways and modes of talking about areas of social life associated with certain general institutions, professions or disciplines, or with certain general ideological and political positions regarding areas of speaking about, um, regarding the modes of speaking about areas of social life, I was interested in how discourse is used in relation to practice or action. For example, the domain of law can't be understood apart from its legal discourse and the practice of the legal sphere through contracts, arbitration, and the function of the courts. As I was studying official documentation, because they are Commission of Inquiry reports um, and that they are produced in and by the state, I was interested in literature on official discourse, the topic of official discourse, how it's produced um, and the way that it operates as a necessary requirement for political and ideological hegemony. Features of official discourse include its legal and rational character and the way that it's often um, enunciated through expert knowledge. So this became very uh, clear while looking at uh, analyzing commissions of inquiry and the very formal legal modes of um, addressing people in the room and the way things are represented in the reports and so forth. So once I decided on the approach to discourse that I'd be using, I then had to decide on the approach to ideology, which was maybe a little bit more difficult and the reason being is that there are many approaches to ideology. I think people, you could write a whole thesis and indeed many books have been written on the various approaches to ideology and how to understand them. In this image on alone, we've got a picture of Karl Marx and we've got Stuart Hall in the middle. And on the other side, it's a, um, the cover of a film by Zizek. Um, so examples of all the texts, some of the texts written on ideology would include Marx and Engels' more pole polemical text, The German Ideology. There's works by Lorraine and Eagleton, which trace the development of Marxist approaches to ideology. Others like Thurborn have developed a theory of ideology, looking at how it organizes, maintains, tra and transforms power in society. 
And Stuart Hall has also highlighted various problems in the approaches to ideology, particularly within the Marxist tradition. So these works have led to many subsequent debates concerning what ideology is and the range of phenomena that ought to be included in the concept um, or what can even be named to be ideological. So in summary, here are a couple of the views that, that were found. So uh, I'm, and yeah, these, I'm just putting them out um, without the particular theorists behind them. But we can have the process and production of meanings, signs, and values in social life, a body of ideas characteristic of a particular group or class, ideas which help legitimate a dominant political power, false ideas which help to legitimate a dominant political power, systematically distorted communication, that which offers a position for a subject, forms of thought motivated by social interests, the conjunction of discourse and power, or the medium in which various or in which conscious social actors make sense of their world. And the list goes on. So it's clear that many of these aren't compatible with one another. If ideology means any set of beliefs motivated by social interest, then it can't also signify the dominant forms of thought in society, right? We also see that some of these formulations are pejorative, pejorative in the sense that they imply something negative, um, something like systematically distorted communication, while others aren't pejorative at all, referring to any position. So if we look at B, for example, a body of ideas characteristic of a particular group or class, this would be what, um, what could be termed a neutral approach. So I could say, my own views are ideological without any sense that they are false or chimeral in any way. Some views also give a sense that one is not seeing the world clearly or for what it really is. This has been an approach that's usually associated with the Marxist lineage from Hegel to Marx and Lukács, which present ideology as some kind of distortion or illusion. Um, or that there's some kind of mystification going on. But an alternative trend in the Marxist tradition um, would be more concerned, not so much with the truth or falsity, but more with how ideas function in social life. Um, not, yeah, not so much whether they're true or false. Um, and so, the two ways then we can understand an approach to ideology in general, although of course there are many, is that ideology can be understood from a neutral or a critical um, conception. From a neutral perspective, ideology can refer to any coherent set of beliefs that supports some form of determined social action. The neutral conception may employ the term ideology as purely descriptive, synonymous with a system of thought or to use uh, Foucault's term, a regime of truth. From this perspective, there's no distinction between ideologies that serve the interest of a particular social group or those that drive certain types of social action, so such as ideologies of resistance and liberation. Such a neutral perspective would view fascism and feminism as alike ideologies. A critical conception, however, conveys a negative or more sort of critical and pejorative understanding of the term, where one that's posited, um, sorry, oh there where that which is posited as ideological is presented as illusory or one-sided. Um, and in that, it sort of contains some kind of inherent condemnation. Um, so you can think about how you would like use it. You'd look at like the Nazi regime to say, well, of course that was um, ideology or those sort of lies told about Jewish people. Um, so that was clearly ideological. So clearly we can see that a critical approach entails a more restrictive understanding of the notion of ideology, um, connoting that something would be misleading. 
Of course, both approaches have their use. It depends on what you're studying and your area of study, um, but the distinction is quite an important one. For my purposes, I was drawn to the critical approach to ideology because I was studying official discourse in commissions of inquiry that were investigating st state violence in the mining sector, because I wanted to understand how power was operating through the commission of inquiry, um, how state power was operating, the power of the state vis-a-vis -vis the mining company, or of course the police versus other organs of the state. Um, so I was really trying to see how the Commission of Inquiry became a mediating form for these various um, sides of power. Just to say as well that there is actually, there's a considerable amount of academic suspicion um, towards the approach or the, the concept of ideology. Um, I might be wrong, but I, I think that this has its roots in uh, post-structuralism and post-modernism. Um, and some of you are probably aware of this tradition. Although distinct approaches, post-structuralism and post-modernism are similar in that they have a distrust generally of totalizing discourses or the, like the idea of the universal truth. So linked to Foucault's idea of regimes of truth, a post-modernist position would be suspicious of a critical approach to ideology um, and discourse since it's believed to be impossible for one discourse to pass judgment on another because power is everywhere or everything is ideological, value laden and socially constructed. So Foucault and his followers, we see that they abandoned the approach to ideology or the concept of ideology, preferring the more capacious notion of discourse in general. However, there's a useful distinction to be made between the neutral approach to discourse as ideology and a critical approach to ideology. And I get this from Terry Eagleton. For Eagleton, he says, the force of the term ideology lies in its capacity to discriminate between those power struggles which are somehow central to a whole form of social life and those which are not. So one can agree with Foucault that power is everywhere whilst maintaining that in certain contexts, particular manifestations of it are more harmful or more undesirable than in others. This is my view. To say that everything is ideolog ideological or everything is political, for me, um, emptied the concept of its meaning and its force and its capacity to identify forms of thought or action that may be harmful or that we ought to identify as sustaining existing relations of social domination which I would like to eradicate. Okay, so as I was dealing with social groups in my analysis, for example, in the Marikana saga, the main actors under investigation were the state or the police, the mine workers, and then Lonman, the mining company uh, where the massacre took place. I narrowed down my focus on ideology to the relation between ideology and interests. So I was interested in how various discursive forms were serving the particular interests of the actors involved. By focusing on the relationship between ideology and interests, I hoped to avoid some of the more vexed questions related to the truth or falsity of ideology or ideology as false consciousness because this avenue I found could often lead to contradiction. The distinction between truth and falsity is also not so clear cut. For example, an ideology may be true enough in what it asserts, but false in what it denies. So an example that I encountered, for instance, in the Farlem Commission of Inquiry, um, for Farlem is the Marikana Commission of Inquiry, um, and its legal approach or adoption of legal discourse. The commission found this was one of the main findings of the commission. The commission found that the main um, reason for the violence having erupted was the mine workers initial decision to strike outside of the legal bargaining arrangements that are set out in the Labor Resources Act. <clears throat> um, so one of the prescriptions of that is that strikers need to be have union representation when engaging in strike action. 
So from a particular legal and ideological position, this is true. Um, the mine workers did engage in, a, as the um, terms I've highlighted here, unprotected strike or illegal strike or what came to be also termed a wildcat strike in, in the media and other official discourse um, outlets in, in, other, you know, in other media. Um, so it can be true on one level, but at another level, what this discourse does is it conceals the power struggles within unions and the reasonable reason why workers would choose to strike outside of these legal arrangements. Or the fact that a large portion of Lonman's workforce was actually ununionized, and that's because they're employed via labor brokers and are therefore not actual employees of Lonman Mine. Then this has been a way for the mine to keep wages low um, and for the company to essentially be unaccountable to both workers as well as labor, labor law. So my argument in relation to this point was that the legal ideology may at the surface be true, but it also conceals something about the social world which operates to sustain relations of domination or subordination. And so <clears throat> using this particular approach of the relationship between particular interests and ideology, the linchpin for my study really became the question of domination. And I drew on John Thompson's work as he proposes this con critical conception of ideology as the mobilization of meaning to sustain relations of domination, or as he later wrote, to establish and sustain, um, just to establish and sustain relations of domination. With this approach, Thompson is um, trying to trying to restore this critical drive to ideology. Um, and he also maintains that ideology is best analyzed when doing some kind of applied analysis when it's part of a more general social theory. So that will also depend on your particular analytical and theoretical lens in, in the approach that you're bringing to your work. Uh, in my case, I was taking a more materialist or Marxist approach in my understanding of the social world, um, which I also won't elaborate on, but if you have questions, we can talk about it. So what made Thompson's approach useful to my study of post-apartheid commissions was also his conception of domination in myriad forms, so not necessarily as only rooted in class terms, but in any kind of systematically asymmetric power relation. So yeah, this was the approach that I used in analyzing discursive aspects of the commission reports, centering on their conceptions of violence and revealing the implications of these particular conceptions of violence, which tended towards presenting the striking mine workers as criminal and irrational while presenting the police action as the, as the opposite, as rational, as reasonable, lawful, and sensible. So I hope that this clarified a bit about how one might go about choosing a method um, and how I tailored my approach to, to discourse and ideological analysis. Um, generally, one would have a sort of methods chapter or methods section in a body of work like a master's or a PhD, although I don't think I did in my master's. Um, but yeah, in a, in a PhD, you would have probably something like a theoretical section or a theoretical and methodological section where, where you have the grounds to, to justify which, which approach you're using, um, which can be constructed based on um, other literature or other approaches. Um, and also just lastly, that this approach would be appropriate for various other research topics particularly ones maybe that make use of official documentation or things like speeches um, as the data. And in projects that are attempting to understand maybe other modes of social legitimation. So I will stop there and yeah, I welcome the discussion and any um, questions or comments.
Thank you so much, Claire, for this uh, wonderful account of your journey through, um, you know, uh, selecting a, a method that was appropriate to your to your object and your goal, and also for your very precise, um, uh, you know, account of of um, the, the the history of the of the concept of ideology notably. So thank you so much. It was uh, fascinating. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions. And and because because I'm the host, I have the privilege to, to ask you first question that that uh, interests me. And as you know, I already told you that I was uh, absolutely fascinated with 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 you know what we do as a social researcher with the with the concept of ideology. But but actually my question is not going to be about that. I'll, I'll let others maybe ask about that. My question was um, about about your selection of the methods and your and the decision that it um, the decision that that you made. Of course, as all decision we 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 make when we when we when we do that um, is is having you leave out certain certain aspect of 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 the the social reality that you're uh, that you're describing analyzing etc so for example you mentioned you mentioned uh, that you know when you know um, starting with your with the discourse analysis there's a few options such as you know the, the coded up approach that you left out of the linguistic uh, approach one also that you uh, I, i'm not sure if i don't think that you mentioned it but but you you left out is is the um the more uh the the analysis or the description of the of the more performative aspect of of the of the discourse um mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, and, and and just just as you con you, you you concluded, you you um, you mentioned and you 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 listed a few topics that would be uh, uh, interesting candidates for a discourse analysis, and and, and one was uh, the the analysis of speeches, and and so for for me like one of the um, thing that I, I was wondering is how do you account for um, the, the, the performative aspect of the discourse? Um, how do you account for the, the context, um, the physical context, the silence, the, 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 the physical presence or absence, etc. cetera, um, we, we, without, without like um, adding to the discourse analysis and, and, and um, Adding some ethnography. Of course, you, I'm an anthropologist, as the anthropologist speaking, also wanting to to always add a little more to um, to, to the discourse mm -hmm. and to have to have also uh, interaction uh, taken into account. So that's what that was that was what I was thinking of, and and I think I, I wanted also to to ask you, um, you know, your your advice is, you know, for for uh, PhD candidates when they decide that they are going to leave, to, to leave out certain aspects and and how do you make how do you make uh, this call um, and and how do you justify, you know, because always at defense people are like, but you didn't talk about that and you always want to say, yeah, I know, I, <laughs> I I'm not talking about everything. I made a choice and that's my choice. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with all of those things? Thank you. Sure. Should I, can I just respond to you now or should yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can answer and I'm going to collect the other. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I researched that the great thing about being a researcher is that you can also change your mind as you go and things rear their heads that you didn't also expect. So I set out analyzing the official discourse um, on on these that the commissions were analyzing because um, obviously there are many other ways that we could approach the topic of Maracana. There's a way I could go and interview people who were involved and get their perspective of the commission and all these things, which is in other forms where I've analyzed as people like, did you interview mine workers? Did you interview? So I was like, no, well, I'm really interested in the in the official discourse. So how does the state represent what's happening um, and why? So what kind of power relations is maybe the state trying to sustain? Um, that was where I set out. But I also in doing my research then discovered that one had to make a distinction between 
the final product, which is the final report of the Commission of Inquiry, and the process. So the process of actually the process of the Commission of Inquiry itself. And that's when I started consulting the transcription of the day-to-day -day performative aspect of the discourse, right? So when you have the judge at the front of the room addressing people, um, performing the various um, decorum and um, rituals of the courtroom, for instance, swearing your hand on the Bible before you speak and, and, and all of these things, those actually became really important to me. I actually wrote um, sections and chapters on this and how the this contradiction between trying to present itself officially as this legal rational um, institution whilst at the same time also um, performing these sort of more mystical things like swearing your hand on the Bible before you're speaking and things which more actually contradict a more rational um, approach to things. So that became really fascinating, moving kind of away from the official discourse, but also when looking at how the various people giving testimony then in the commission actually sought to disrupt the official discourse or the official narrative about what was happening. So for instance, um, when our well, current president, he wasn't the president at the time, so Ramaphosa was being um, cross-examined, there was a contention of uh, toxic collusion between the state and Lonman Mine and how this had um, contributed actually to the massacre. And so while Sil Ramaphosa was giving his uh, cross-examination, a group of activists who were in the crowd started shouting, blood on his hands, blood on his hands, he's got blood on his hands, and the commission had to be stopped um, for a recess because this, you know, they couldn't carry on. And then Judge Farlam had to reprimand everyone to say, you know, you cannot carry on like this. This is a civilized country and this is a civilized commission and it cannot be interrupted and so forth. But then you had this official account, the official discourse of the state disrupted by these unofficial or contestatory, what I called contestatory discourses, and how this also then became part of the official discourse because then this idea of toxic collusion actually features in the report. Although the report dismisses it and says there's no evidence that there was toxic collusion, this then entered this um, official commission space and was also televised um, around the country. Um, this, this, the, the, the sound of he has blood on his hands referring to uh, President, current president Ramaphosa. So I showed how then the official and the unofficial actually sort of imp implementing affect each other in really fascinating ways. Um, so this is, I guess, an example of how you can change your mind, you know, you can start off doing one thing and then use that to, to kind of find your way into something else, which is, I think, part of the like, creative discovery that's, that's available to all of us as researchers. Um, but the idea was that it was still anchored in an idea of official discourse. And then from that, I sort of developed this idea of, well, what are the more unofficial or contestatory discourses that also come to the fore in these commissions of inquiry. Uh, thank you so much. That's that's really fascinating. And I, you know, like the, yeah, the, the, the ritual of the court uh, room that you're describing, that sounds like, like a very interesting chapter that I, I hope I can read. <laughs> is there, is there uh, questions in the, in the room? Um, I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to ask only what I want. And also I already have a PhD, so I don't, I'm not going to ask questions about, <laughs> about methods. Um, I, I'm okay, I'm looking at the chat. I'm not sure if there's a question yet. Yeah, I see, yeah? okay, okay, sorry. Okay. I, well, I, I, can you introduce yourself because I don't see I don't see you. Okay, I'm uh, Serge Domanu. Okay. Uh, I'm in Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa. Uh, so uh, I was very interested in uh, participating in this seminar, and uh, I have one question. So uh, I forgot the name, but anyway, this is my question. 
you, you, you made a strong statement saying that everything is ideological. You get me? My, my English is, is not that good, eh? okay. No, no, we, we hear you. Okay, hear you. so you make a strong statement saying that everything is ideological. <laughs> And then I want to find out whether, as far as social discourse is concerned, is the truth possible? Is it possible to get to the truth? And then I think uh, for your analysis, you have chosen, do you get me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, uh, uh, to, for your analysis, you have chosen the critical approach ideology, ideology, okay? So since everything is ideological, is there any ideology behind your choice? Yeah. I finish. Do you get my question? Yes, I do, I do. <laughs> it's okay. a great question. <laughs> but, 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 but by, by choosing the critical approach ideology for your analysis, is there any ideological, uh, uh, how do you call it, background that determine that kind of choice? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, thank yeah, you. That's a great question. Yeah, so starting with the, the notion that everything is ideological. So I was citing a particular tradition in the social sciences that, um, that it's, as you imply, impossible for one discourse or position to pass judgment on another one and say, well, that's ideological, but that one's not, or that I have some kind of enlightened non-ideological hat on and can just object objectively analyze everything, right? So this, is a, this has been a, a very long debate in social sciences. Um, the question of whether truth is possible also becomes um, complex because um, like I was saying, when, when we apply the lens of ideology that something can be true in some respects, but then viewed from another perspective can be mm -hmm. false. Um, of course, there's the more sort of epistemological question about truth, like will the sun rise at this particular time because it's this time of the year and according to the you know, geology and science, that's the time that the sun rises and that's a, that's a true fact and no one can dispute it. Um, so when, when dealing with interpreting an event like a commission report, I wasn't so much concerned with saying this was wrong and this is like, this is actually what happened. I was more concerned with how does, what is the logic behind what is the logic with which the commission is coming to its version of truth? Um, and so when it came to particular findings in the Farnham Commission, for example, my, my argument was that it was using a conservative legal lens in its approach to analyzing what had transpired and that constrained its findings in certain ways. So the, the truth or the, the version of events that are presented um, obscured something else um, about social life. Um, so that was how I tried to avoid these questions more of, well, this is true and this is false, or to say, well, you know, Farlam is wrong for coming to that decision. Those arguments did abound as well, like there have been other reports written by social civil society groups or researchers who have gone over the evidence that has been presented to the Farlam Commission and said, well, it was actually irrational for the commission to come to these, um, to come to these conclusions. Um, but that's not so much what I was concerned with. I was concerned with how the various discourses like a legal discourse constrained findings um, and presented some forms of violence as legitimate whilst presenting others as illegitimate. Um, and then in terms of me also having an ideological view, I definitely do have one. I think I said that when I said like my approach, my general theory, social theory approach was one that was more steeped in a, a Marxist tradition and trying to ascertain various relations of domination. Um, so I was looking at, at, at it from a point at how was the view of the mine workers being um, 
maybe distorted. Um, but I'm okay with that. Um, I don't need, I don't, I'm, I'm okay with say, with sort of wearing my position on my sleeve with that. Um, so I would say, yes, I, I also have a, an ideological view. However, according to my own, um, my own framework, which views ideology as a approach to sort of sustain relations of domination, my approach would be more to try and unpick or unravel those relations of domination or, or to explain them. So it's definitely belongs to the realm of ideology. Um, but yeah, I think you're, you're, you're probably right. I, I definitely have my own socially constructed view in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, great question, great answer. And um, yeah, um, everybody, everybody had to go through like the reflexivity and 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 you know writing about about positionality and stances and and you know um, no obligation to be neutral, but obligation to to clarify and 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 justify oneself. Uh, we have a question from Aza. Um, now, uh, Aza, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Claire, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my question for you will be, um, could you tell us um, what sort of limitation that, that someone could face when they are using such kind of a, a approach for analysis and how does it inform, uh, how, or how did it inform your own, like how did you overcome these challenges? Hmm. Yeah, again, I think it's linked to the question that was just asked, um, which was trying to grapple with these various approaches to ideology. And at, at one point, I was very ready, even though I'd mostly written my chapter. And just, just I really wanted, I, it seemed right to me to include the concept of ideology. And at one point, I was like, I think I just need to take it out completely because I had this internal dilemma about, well, like, is not, aren't you just kind of contradicting yourself to say that this is ideological and then just, you know, to say that maybe your view isn't also in some respect tainted. But it was actually when I came across Thompson's book on and viewing ideology more in terms of, okay, what are the interests here um, being advanced, which sort of settled my anxiety around it because then it didn't come, it didn't boil down so much to what's true and what's false. But it's about okay. How does this discourse maintain? So how does this discourse operate in a way that sustains certain interests or operates to advantage certain interests whilst disadvantaging others? And so the what became clear in this was that in the official discourse used in the commission was that the state was really being advantaged. Lonman Mine was being advantaged, and the the. Um, political agency and legitimacy of the strike of the mine workers was was that was being undermined in this discourse and so for me narrowing down my approach to ideology in that way helped to overcome the the struggle that I associated with it and that would probably be the the biggest limitation to, to thinking about ideology. And it's probably a reason why since the cultural turn, there's been a real um, move away from the concept of ideology. Like I said in the beginning towards speaking more generally at the level of discourse and power. But I felt, I felt that it was, that it's important concept to try and retrieve um, because if there's something that the concept of ideology can do that I feel like discourse can't really. Um, so that that's how I personally overcame it. But again, it's something that you would have to do in your own research and your own reading and coming up with your own approach to it. Um, where where you would see, you know, what to see what you're comfortable and how you would use it in your work. But yeah, that's how I reconciled myself with the some of the issues associated with the method and the um, concept. Thank you so thank you so much Claire. Uh, I'm looking at the at the chat I see um, 
I see a comment or a question. Um, should should I read it or is uh, the? I think Jaya want to uh, read it or comment aloud. Thank you, Dominic. Um, I'm just commending Claire on the fact that her, her justification uh, in terms of her ideological leaning uh, is on track. It's one of the wonderful things about research. It allows us to frame our studies uh, within a particular epistemological lens. And she elected to go critical transformative. And um, yes, Andina, I like the, the pride and the confidence with which uh, you state that. And that's wonderfully creative in research. Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Is, is there uh, any uh, final um, question, comment? We are approaching the the end of this uh, seminar, but uh, if there is like one pressing question for Claire, uh, I'm sure she would be uh, more than happy to, to answer it. Okay, I think I've, I've posed enough to, <laughs> to, leave, to, to give an opportunity for a final question. So uh, Claire, uh, thank, thank you so much. It was fantastic, uh, a brilliant presentation that, you know, uh, uh, Give us like a little bit of uh, taste of your of your work, and uh, we are looking forward to reading more, um, hearing uh, more about uh, like the content and the flesh uh, of of your research. So thank you so much. Um, so next next uh, for the next seminar, which will not be in two in next week, but in two weeks on June second, we will welcome. Uh, uh, fellow, postdoctoral fellow, fellow postdoctoral fellow, <laughs> Yusra Amdawi, um, and she's going to uh, present a, a, a paper uh, in, entitled "Doing Research in a War Zone." So, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, I have a question. I had a problem uh, in the sound. I fixed it now. Can I? Okay, okay, let's, let's take that uh, final, final. Uh, yes, please, yes, please. Thank you so much, uh, Claire. I have this question. Don't you think that uh, CDA is all about ideology? So we cannot but focus on ideology, whatever the topic of the conducted study is. So it's all about ideology. Everything is related to ideology. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so critical discourse analysis, I um, I would say I maybe like started there. That's the Norman Fairclough approach, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I started there. Um, and I guess why I didn't, I, I mean, I think in my initial proposal, my initial PhD proposal, I said I'm doing critical discourse analysis. Um, but I suppose I wanted to make it more... Yeah, I, I ended up just rather looking at the relationship between discourse and ideology at a more general level. And I suppose Thompson's approach just resonated a bit more than, than the one, than critical discourse analysis. That one was focused a lot more on like the semiotics um, I found. Mm -hmm. So how certain pronouns are used and looking at like a very particular language use um, where I was, because of the volume of things that I was, um, looking at like each commission report is like 600 words and then all the the transcriptions and things like that I suppose I was looking for more general patterns but it's definitely like a consistent approach and it would have been probably equally suitable to achieve my kind of study um yeah thank you thank you uh, thank you, thank you so much. There's, there's, there's more comments, but I, I think there are more there are more praise. So uh, we are going to to try to uh, save them, and and uh, it's always delightful to have praise, right? So uh, we'll we'll try to uh, forward those to you. Um, so Hi. so thank you. Um, yeah, just a correction. Uh, you right that is in the room corrected me. Like the, the title of the presentation is doing field work in a war zone. So that's what we're going to hear about. So I hope I'm right. You're right. 
uh, I might be also pitching. Yes, yes, it's right. Thank you, okay. thank you, Dominique. <laughs> thank you. So we are we are excited to we're excited to um, to hear your thought in two weeks. And thanks again, Claire. And now it's going to be uh, time for us to uh, to say goodbye this time for good. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you very much. And and uh, I hope that to, I hope to see uh, uh, many more of the of um, of the, the folks that were in the audience today or in the room today next time. Uh, coucou à nos amis en Côte d'Ivoire. And um, yeah. Thanks uh, so much everyone for your questions and, and for, for coming. Bye. Bye-bye. I mean, are you, who is,